Assalamu alaikum and welcome back once again to today in African history with Baba Shaka. I'm Baba Shaka and today is August 14th, 2021. And it was on this date, 115 years ago, that African troops in the U.S. military were falsely accused of conducting a raid on Brownsville, Texas. The Brownsville Raid of August 13th and 14th, that's yesterday's date and today's date, back in 1906, was an alleged attack by soldiers from companies B, C, and D of the Black 25th United States Infantry stationed at Fort Brown, which resulted in the largest summary dismissal in the history of the United States Army. The 1st Battalion, Minus, Headquarters, and Company A arrived at Brownsville, which was a community of 6,000 from recent duty in the Philippines and Fort Niobrara in Nebraska, and that was on July 28. The soldiers immediately confronted racial discrimination from some businesses and suffered several instances of physical abuse from federal customs collectors. A reported attack on a white woman during the night of August 12 so angered many townspeople that Major Charles W. Penrose, after consultation, with Major Frederick Cohn, declared an early curfew the following day to avoid trouble. Now, the evening passed peacefully until around midnight when a brief shooting spree claimed the life of bartender Frank Natos and destroyed the arm of Police Lieutenant M.Y. Dominguez. Now, various residents claimed to observe soldiers running through the streets shooting. Despite the darkness of the hour and vantage points of considerable distance, they still saw stuff, right? Now, several sets of civilian and military investigations presumed the guilt of the soldiers without identifying individual perpetrators. The Citizens Committee, co cooperating with Penrose's own inquiry, successfully demanded the removal of the troops but failed to receive white replacements. Major Augustus P. Um, Bloxham of the Army Southwestern v Division deemed the soldiers uncooperative and urged their dismissal if they refused to turn evidence. So if they didn't turn on each other, they had to be dismissed, right? Now, the men denied any knowledge of the shooting. While officers and a sentry reported hearing pistols fire outside of the reservation, Texas Ranger Captain William Jesse McDonald pursued the trail to 12 enlisted men whom he arrested for holding positions key to a conspiracy. I don't know what that means, key to a conspiracy. However, a Cameron County grand jury failed to return any indictment. Inspector General Ernest A. Garlington charged a quote-unquote conspiracy of silence against the companies and urged implementation of Black Sum's suggestion, which is removal. Now, accordingly, on November 5th, President Theodore Roosevelt summarily discharged quote-unquote without honor all 167 enlisted men previously garrisoned in Fort Brown. Now, the action of Roosevelt, who had served with black troops in the Spanish-American War and conspicuously appointed Africans in America to office, shocked his black constituency and moved the controversy to the national stage. The Constitution League, a civil rights organization, decried the lack of due process accorded the soldiers and questioned the timing of the order, which followed the congressional elections. Amid signs of alienation that could jeopardize the presidential ambitions of Secretary of War William Howard Taft, Senator Joseph B. Farrakhan, Republican of Ohio, urged a Senate investigation. The Farrakhan, a nemesis of Roosevelt and an aspiring presidential candidate in his own right, kept the issue alive through speeches and writings over the next several years. He and Roosevelt clashed in addresses to the Gridiron Club in 1907 and hired private detectives to enhance their investigations. The Senate Military Affairs Committee, which included Farrakhan, conducted hearings while courts martials cleared Penrose, an officer of the day, Captain Edgar A. Macklin, of alleged negligence. So the, the white officers were cleared, but the black enlisted men got dismissed without honor. The majority report issued in March 1908 concurred with the official White House decision. While a minority of four Republicans found the evidence inconclusive, yet 
another minority report submitted by Farquhar and Morgan B. Bulkley, another Republican from Connecticut, assorted the soldiers' innocence. It assailed alleged con contradictory, insufficient, and contrived evidence and bias of witnesses and investigators. The report suggested that the townspeople or outsiders had staged the raid to banish the black troops or to avenge customs enforcement. Submitting to pressure, the administration appointed a board of retired army officers to review applications for re-enlistment. Now, after interviewing somewhat over half the applicants, the Court of Military Inquiry in 1910 inexplicably approved only 14 of the men. Of 167, only 14 were approved. The decision, in conjunction with Taft's presidential victory, Roosevelt's retirement, and Farquhar's failure to win renomination, effectively closed the matter for more than 60 years. But in 1972, convinced by recent research critical of the government's handling of the affair, Representative Augustus Hawkins, Democrat from California, urged justice for the debarred soldiers. The Nixon administration agreed and awarded honorable discharge, but without pay. So they get honorable discharge, but no back pay, all right? Still, maintaining the battalion's innocence Dorsey Willis, the only surviving veteran, received a $25,000 pension. Right. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but it seems there's a reoccurring theme in American history when it comes to the destruction and oppression of Africans in America. Whether it's the alleged um, raid on Brownsville, or the destruction of Rosewood, or the annihilation of Black Wall Street, or the Slocum Massacre, the violence always seemed to be triggered by the same thing. The assault of a white woman by a black man. Whenever some white folks get the urge to unleash some mindless violence on black bodies, all they have to say is, it's a, that it's a black man did it to a white woman. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be anything, real or perceived. It, does, it didn't matter then, and it seems that it doesn't matter now. Now, that would explain this national epidemic, or rather, this national infestation of Karens. White women all over America who seem intent on solving whatever issues they may have by simply pointing to an African person, male or female, adult or child, and screaming, Wolf! Thank goodness for cell phone cameras. Now, the cameras don't stop the foolishness, but they do record and chronicle the shenanigans and sometimes come to the aid of the often falsely accused African. The struggle continues. Now, thank you to all of our subscribers who continue to support our efforts here at Today in African History. For those of you who have not yet subscribed, hit that, please hit that subscribe button just below there and lend us your much needed support. Please like and leave a comment down in the comment section just below. But most importantly, please share especially with the young amongst us, because you and I know this material is not taught in our schools. So, until tomorrow, inshallah, this is Baba Shaka with Today in African History. Masalam.